Um, also, welcome back, uh, Auntie Mandy, and uh, it's lovely to have you with us here today. If anyone else is back from holidays, I'm, I can't keep track of everybody, my brain is fried, literally. Um, so, uh, welcome back, it's lovely to see you here. And I understand that there's been a big reveal, is that right? Last night there was a big reveal, and the gender is... A boy! It's a baby boy! <laughs> um, uh, have you guys had a big reveal yet? Have you had a big reveal yet? No, not yet. All right, so we're waiting for another big reveal. Okay. So I'd like to also congratulate Alex and Esther too, who are also expecting. It's lovely to be in a church where people are expecting babies. What a joy. Uh, so anyway, it's lovely to see you all here. Um, welcome back. I'm so excited to share with you my PowerPoint and my testimony about what God has done during the last year. I wish more people would come and hear it uh, because God really blessed us in so many ways. And I've done a lot of work on this. In fact, on Tuesday night, I stayed up working from like uh, 10 p.m. until 6 a.m. I worked the whole night, a bit naughty. But you know, when you have insomnia, by the way, that's all work. So, so, and then I slept from 6 till 9, and then I came to school to present it. So I've really worked hard on this, um, and I'm excited to share with you these little things that God did this year. Would you tell your neighbors around you and give them a very warm welcome to church this morning as we and welcome to our church here this morning. Good
before. My soul yearns and thanks for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Even the sparrows found the home of the swallow a nest where she may lay her young. A place near your altar. Lord Almighty, my King and my God. And blessed are those who dwell in your house. They are always praising you. How great is our God. His presence is with us in this morning.
It's your presence that we see, your presence. Even as you were with us in the garden so many years before, you were with Israel in the temple. You are with us now in our hearts by your Holy Spirit. You are the prize. You are the beginning and the end. You are our all in all. Jesus, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we worship you, Lord God. We acknowledge you to be the Lord. You alone are worthy of our praise and all our love. Let's declare our faith, church, this morning. He is everything.
not live to ourselves, and we do not die to ourselves. If we live, we live for the Lord. And if we die, we try to die to the Lord. So then whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. And for this end, for this purpose, Christ died and lived again, that he might be Lord of both the dead and of the living. Let us try together in our theme prayer for the fifth and Sunday of the season of Pentecost as we say together, O oh God, because without you we are not able to please you. Mercifully grant that your Holy Spirit may in all things direct and rule our hearts. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, our Amen. Please be seated, friends. Just before we have the reading, whenever we sing the creed, um, there's always, I can hear people singing, I believe in the, in the virgins, the virgins birth, possessing, S apostrophe S. Guys, it's not the virgins birth. We're all born virgins. Hello? <laughs> Saying you believe in the virgins birth is kind of meaningless because we're all born virgins, all right? We believe in the virgin birth. That, that is to say, we believe that she, it's not referring to Mary's birth, it's referring to Jesus' birth. We believe that Jesus was conceived of the Holy Spirit and born of Mary, who had not uh, been together with her husband Joseph yet. So that's the miracle that we believe in. So when we say that, please get it right. I always hear people singing, I believe in the virgin's birth, and I want to go, no! <laughs> We're all virgins, all right? So it's not we believe in the virgin's birth. It's not referring to Mary. It's referring to Jesus, the birth of Jesus. All right, let's have our first reading. These are wonderful readings about forgiveness this morning. Thank you, Uncle Dominic. Children, so does the Lord care for those who fear him. 
Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and before We have our, our second reading from the Epistle to the Church in Rome, which is read to us by me. Thank you.
Let us remain standing as we sing the hallelujah to welcome the good news of the gospel. yourself 
uh, please do, please take this home, don't throw it in the bin, please take it home and read it, uh, there's a lot of things coming up. Especially Friendship Sunday, I urge you to bring friends to hear Anil, you know Anil was here recently and he has a wonderful anointing of the sense of, of Jesus, the presence of Jesus on his life. He works with the persecuted church in Asia and has wonderful things to share, wonderful stories about what they're going through. So do please bring friends to Friendship Sunday. We're also looking for somebody to organize the lunch. So um, when we used to do Friendship Sunday lunch before COVID, it cost us about 10 or 11,000. Now it costs about 19 or 20,000. So um, it's more expensive to do Friendship Sunday lunch. So we either need to do potluck or not do it, just have morning tea, or somebody needs to pay for it. And last Sunday somebody paid for it, and I'd like to thank that somebody very, very much. Can we give them a clap even without announcing their name? Um, thank you to the general donor. So if you feel like taking the church to lunch, I think it's, you know, it's, it's going to cost approaching 18, 19,000 now, because uh, costs have gone up. Um, nevertheless, uh, you know, some can afford that. Or if you'd like to coordinate the potluck, maybe some of the ladies group leaders would say, we will need to coordinate and get everybody to bring dishes. That would be great if you could do that. So please see me um, if you'd like to help with that. It's the 24th, so it's two weeks away coming up. All right, so our next Sunday is Education Sunday, so we will have 17 MAC teachers and 15 children at least coming to join us. So please, next week we're all on duty. Next week you're all on duty to welcome. Please don't talk to your friends next week. Talk to the teachers. No, that sounds wrong. Uh, okay. <laughs> please talk to your friends who are the teachers. <laughs> and, and make them your friends. Uh, and so we can welcome them. And of course, some of them may not be Christian. We may get teachers of other religion. We'll certainly get teachers from other denominations. So we really want to love them and make them welcome uh, next Sunday. All right. Um, is there anything else? I think that's everything. Let's, um, have I forgotten anything? Welcome back, Maggie. <laughs> nice to see you. Uh, all right. Uh, let's stand and um, join the hands as we sing. May God's blessing surround you each day. <coughs>
When we first got the news of cancer, it was devastating, and I'll be explaining that. But I, it turns out, after we got more information and they did the biopsy and they checked the DNA, it was a cancer which is very responsive to radiation. So I was very, very fortunate. I've been licensed to tell you this morning that we used to have a, a church member at our 9 o'clock service called Henry Crockman, who many of you know. And Henry licensed me to share with you this morning that he's just received what they think is a diagnosis of cancer of the liver and the lungs. Um, and he was in Macau last week to have a scan. Um, I think it hasn't been confirmed, they have to do biopsies, so I hope it's not a false alarm, but Henry said the scan looked really bad. So let's pray that it's treatable. And um, he's going to go to Queen Mary Hospital this week for, for um, a scan. It's quite difficult for Henry, you know, because his family's in, in East Java. East Java, West Java, in Indonesia, West Java, Indonesia. And um, he's been unemployed for a year or more now. So his money running out. And um, it's quite a difficult situation for Henry. So uh, let's keep Henry in our prayers. And, um, but I really want to say to you this morning from Romans, whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. Now, it's, it's easy to say that. It's cheap to say that. And, and it, you know, I would always be one who would say that. But when you get the diagnosis of cancer, it's a whole other ballgame. Uh, because suddenly it's over. You know, as far as you know, you're, you're going to die. And um, suddenly you, your, your sort of sentiment, oh, whether I live or die, I belong to the Lord. It's all good. You know, suddenly your emotion changes. Your reality changes if you think you're, you're going to die soon. Because you're something like, well, no, I don't want to leave my wife a widow at this age. We have so much to live. I, I haven't finished my work. I've got things to do. I, I'm not ready. <laughs> you know? So... Uh, and then it's a little bit scary, you know, so everything kind of changes. Um, so it's, it's easy for us to say, yes, I believe. But when you get a diagnosis of cancer um, or other terminal illness or sickness, it really makes you pause. My first encounter with cancer was 52 years ago. I have to confess that, that I'm not a good pastor because I didn't know much about cancer. I didn't know that there are hundreds of cancers. Um, there's like over 200 cancers, I think. I didn't know that 40% of people will get cancer at some point in their life. Of those 40, 16 will, will die from it. So actually more than half survive. So, so far I'm in that more than half will survive. But cancer is a huge issue in our society. And Australia gets more cancer than anywhere else in the world because, because of the sun. It's very exposed to ultraviolet and there's a lot of skin cancer. But because of that, they're also one of the most advanced countries in the world for the treatment of cancer. So that's a, a letter that I wrote when I was age 10 to my next door neighbor, Tommy, who was dying of leukemia, rare, a rare um, bone marrow leukemia he had. And um, Tommy, in fact, I never saw him again. He passed away, and that was my first encounter with cancer. I went to his funeral. It was my first time to go to a Catholic church for Tommy. Tommy had been a, a, an altar boy in his church. He was my partner in crime, we were very, very close neighbors, close friends. So sometimes when these things happen, we ask the big why, the big question. Why did Tommy die so young? Why did I get cancer? And this week someone messaged me on Facebook and said, yeah, I want to ask that question. You know, why are you? You're a pastor. You know, you're supposed to be a good guy. You know, isn't God on your side? Why would God let you get cancer? It's not someone who comes to church very often, doesn't have a very you know, sort of uh, a simple faith, they have a simple faith, so, so they, they're going to listen to this later, so fine. But it's a really good question, why, the big why. I have a friend called Marlon, who, who's given his life to be a Christian missionary since he was healed of cancer. S uh, ten years ago, he shared his testimony here. He was dramatically healed. It's a very dramatic, one of those dramatic, unexpected testimonies. And he's going to come, I think it's the end of November, Marlon Simeon, he's going to share his testament. Why was he healed? And others are not. I don't know. Um, you can come and hear his testimony when he comes and judge for yourself. But since he was healed, he's just been full on non-stop telling people about Jesus and praying for the sick and ministering to people. It's, it's changed his life. When I was in Melbourne, I met a senior pastor called Larry, who was retired. He was the father of the pastor of the church I was visiting. I'll show you his picture later. And Larry uh, also had cancer. It had spread all through his body. It was in his organs and his bones, and he was dying. And he went to a revival meeting, and he was instantly and completely healed. All the tumors disappeared. 
And this was so dramatic in his life that he gave his life to Jesus and signed up to be a pastor. And he founded uh, the church uh, that we were attending that my nephew attends. It's a small church, about 100 people. Uh, I hope we can make a connection with them. A lovely little Pentecostal church in West Footscray in Melbourne called Elevation Church. They have great worship. We need to do a worship uh, workshop together with them. Uh, and we can teach them some things too. They can teach us some things. But um, Larry was miraculously healed. Why? But then I have another friend called Philip, who was a full-time missionary his whole life. Philip got mesothelioma as a young man. He was an artist, and he was messing around with asbestos. He got in his lungs. He got mesothelioma, and he he prayed that God would heal him, and he didn't. He died. Why did Philip die? I don't know. So, but what I would say is, we ask the big why to the negatives. We say, well, why did you get sick? But we don't say so much, why did God heal you, or why do I have this blessing? Or why am I so blessed? Or why do I live in this first world country with all this money and resources? Or why, why do I have such a beautiful husband or wife? Or why do I have such beautiful children? We don't ask those things. We're like, oh Lord, save me from my children. <laughs> uh, when there are people who would give their right arm to have one, one of your children. Maybe you can give them away, I don't know. But you understand what I mean. <laughs> I'm saying, you know, we, we, we say, why does bad thing happen to me? But we don't say, why did this good thing happen to me? Why did you make this good thing happen to me? You know, we, we just take our blessings, you know, but we don't take the challenges of life so well. And actually, I never asked this question. When something bad happened to me, when I got cancer, I didn't ask why did this happen to me, because I wouldn't resolve this issue. You know, we, in this world, we get sick and we die. It's part of the fall. And in Genesis, we, we're under the fall. Uh, the world is afflicted by sickness and death. It's coming to all of us. And so there's no why for me. You know, I know that, that bad things happen. I know that this world is not my home. I know I'm just passing through. I know that my home is in, with God in, in heaven. So I don't ask what, why me. Um, anyway, I got, can, I got the answer is I got cancer from a virus, so I know why. It's like asking why did I get the flu? You know, nobody says, why did I get the flu? You know, you got the flu because you went out and got exposed to the virus, right? Well, some cancers are like that, not all. Um, there are many things that cause cancers. So I just wanted to touch on that question before I get into the testimony. Because I think that question of why is the background to, to this testimony in a sense. Now, 22 years ago, I had another encounter with uh, death where I was attacked by an illegal immigrant in Hong Kong and I was chopped with a meat cleaver. They chopped my head, they stabbed me under my arm, and they chopped my hand. I still had a scar there. I can show you it split my finger to the bone. And, um, and I almost had my throat cut. They tried to cut my throat and I was fighting for my life. And um, at the time, when um, my helper was inside the house, locked inside safely, called the ambulance and the police. And when I was in the ambulance on the way to the hospital, and the ambulance man kept saying to me, you're very unlucky, but you're very lucky. And he was sort of scratching his head and saying, you're very unlucky, but you're very lucky. But you're very unlucky. But you were very lucky, and I was like, which is a dude? <laughs> I was lying here on the floor bleeding to death, and uh, he bandaging me up, and I'm like, which is it? Well, I, I guess it's the theme of my life. You're very lucky, but you're very unlucky. So the, the story continued. Last August in 2022, I had a growing sense that I needed, I don't know if it was a sense from God, or just common sense, or maybe common sense is a sense from God, but I had a sense I needed to check my health and my cancer markets. So I got, as one does, a colonoscopy of a joy. Um, I also got an ultrasound. In fact, I, I was seeing my cardiologist and I said, I've got this lump here, I think I need an ultrasound. And he's like, okay, I'll book you in. And then he forgot. <laughs> and so Christmas came and I didn't get it checked and it was getting bigger. And it began to be the size of a chicken's egg, one of my lymph nodes. And so on Friendship Sunday in January, I sat here and Dr. Lindy, I said, Dr. Lindy, can you, can you check me? Because um, something's not right. And she checked and she said, you need an ultrasound. And she sent me for an ultrasound. And it was just on the eve of Chinese New Year. And the ultrasonographer is like 5.30 5 p.m. On, on Friday night before the Chinese New Year weekend. And the ultrasonographer said, I need to call you a doctor. And I was like, ah, oh, that's not good. And then she called Lindy and they talked in Cantonese, so I didn't know what they were saying. And then Lindy came on the phone and she said, well, there's nothing we can do now because it's Chinese New Year, but next week we need a biopsy. So next week I have the biopsy, which means they put a fine needle, FNA is fine needle aspiration. They put a fine needle into, uh, it's a kind of lance, 
into the, the chicken's egg and they scraped out some stuff from the middle and from the sides uh, at Kyungwoo Hospital and I forgot about it. The following week, Crystal and I were due to fly to Melbourne for my nephew's wedding on the Wednesday. But on the Tuesday night, I tested NAT positive for COVID. And now I was, I had had COVID two weeks earlier and I was rat negative, but I tested NAT positive. And that meant I couldn't go to Australia because the Australian government was not letting people in who at that time who were NAT, NAT positive. Now you know the difference, NAT is nucleic acid test, so it's more fine, it's a fine tune. Rat is more of a rough test. The rat is the one you stick the thing up your nose, you know, we've all done that. Been there, done that, got the t-shirt. <laughs> we all did, that's a rat test, all right? So I was rat negative and not positive. So they said, you can't come to Australia for, for the wedding. I was like, ah. But then they said, oh, but if you get a, a GP supervised rat test, then you can come. It's like, okay, I know a friendly GP. So, so, so Wednesday morning, instead of flying, as I should have been, I was at the GP getting my supervised rat test. That turned out to be providential. I didn't know at the time. I came out of the GP and the phone rang again. This time it was Kyungwoo Hospital. They said, you need to come here immediately. And I was like, okay, that's not good too. And then I remembered the biopsy. Ah, okay. So now we were due to fly the next day, Thursday, to Melbourne, Australia. So I went to Kyungwoo Hospital and they have an app for patients. So I, I downloaded the app and I looked up my name and there was the diagnosis. Kung Wu need to check their pastoral care protocol because before I saw the doctor, I read metastatic carcinoma. There it was. First of February, we were due, that's Wednesday, to fly. That's actually the plane we caught on Thursday, by the way, the actual plane. Uh, my first leave, by the way, in three years. <laughs> what a present. Um, and here's the diagnosis. You can see the bottom line. It says lymph node, nodule, left neck, fine needle aspiration, metastatic carcinoma. And I read that and I just sitting alone in the waiting room. It was a pretty depressing place and I just began to cry. I just thought, oh, my life is over. Because metastatic means it's already spread. So that's when they talk about stage 3 or stage 4 or whatever. It's already spread. So I thought, that's not good. It's not just cancer. It's metastatic. It's spreading already. So that was very depressing. And that is the little bugger there. Now if you can't interpret that, that's the cancer. And I'll just go back so you can see without the yellow. That's the base of the tongue on the left side. And that little flappy thing on the top left, that's my vocal cord. So that's what I'm vibrating now to talk to you. There's two of them, you can't see the other one, it's out of the picture. So the vocal cords are healthy, everything around is healthy. But that little pyramid is cancer. And if you don't kill it, it will spread to your organs, your bones, your brain, and your heart, and within a year, you probably you'll be. So, there you go. We sat down and went, I went home. Most difficult thing I think I've ever done is to sit down and tell my wife the news that I had metastatic carcinoma. And we just, two of us, just sat there and tried for about an hour and a half. And uh, we didn't know what it meant. We didn't know what the implications were. We didn't know how serious it was. We, we didn't know what to think. I rang my boss. Turns out he had cancer last year. We didn't know that. They kept it on the down low. So he had a, I don't know which kind of pancreatic or something, and they cut it out and it was all good. They just did surgery, nipped it out, and he's, he's all good. But he had been through a cancer journey the year before. So he was really pastorally kind and really sympathetic. And he was like, Stephen, take as long as you need. Do what you need to do. Go and deal with this. Uh, it'll be okay. You know, the church will be fine. We'll look after the church. And then come back when, when you're well. So that was incredibly helpful. Also, it meant he was putting me on sick leave. So we still had salary. That became very important because in Melbourne, we had a lot of expenses. We had to rent a room. Um, we had to pay for various medications. And, you know, the, the main treatment is paid for by the government, but there's a lot of other stuff that you need when you have cancer. So um, that was really important because we still had, to, uh, still had salary. And he was super supportive. By the way, the picture on the left is the next morning um, on the bus going to Hong Kong. And you can see we're managing a smile by this stage because uh, what happened is the second phone call I made after the bishop was this guy. This handsome looking chap is my little nephew, Matthew, Dr. Matthew. He's an intensivist and an anesthetist. An 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 
anesthetist at Royal Melbourne Hospital. And he's my go-to guy, you know, if I don't know something, so I don't like to bother him, but this was cancer. So I rang Matty up, and I used to carry Matty in my arm, when he was a baby, he would fit from here to here, and I would carry his, his father too, we'd carry him around like this, and uh, he would poop everywhere. And anyway, sorry Matt. Um, so he is a very sweet man, a Christian, lovely Christian man, with three children, a wife and three children now. He's older than he looks, he looks like a baby face, doesn't he? Anyway, um, this is a picture taken in, in Peter Mackle Cancer Hospital, where he came with me to my appointments and support me. So I rang him on the Wednesday and I said, Matt, what does this mean and what do I do? And he said, <clears throat> he said, well, it's quite serious. And um, he said, you need to go and get it checked and find out what kind of cancer it is. And he said, if it's cancer of the tongue, you might need surgery. They might need to remove part of your tongue. You may need facial surgery. Uh, and you may need then reparative surgery after the surgery to remove the cancer. You may need further surgery. So he said, uh, on the other hand, they might just be able to do chemo radiation and, you know, it might be shorter. But he said, either way, you're going to need six or seven months. This is not going to be over quickly. So he said, there is a hospital here, which is really good with cancer, Peter McCallum. But he said, you probably wouldn't want to come. And I was like, boo, why would I not want to come? <laughs> I want to come. And he said, well, it's one of the best in the Southern Hemisphere, one of the best in the world. I'm like, I want to come. And then I said, what does it cost? And he said, well, if you're under the Australian government Medicare, it's free. I'm like, I'm coming. <laughs> Sign me up. You know, why would I not want to come? You know, so and he's such a, such a gracious person. He's like, well, I don't want to bother you, you know. But if I stayed here, um, I would have to have it in Macau or go to Hong Kong. I don't know what, I don't know what resources are available. Now, that afternoon, after we talked to Matt, we went to Gumbu and we met with the head of the ENT, you know, as a uh, doctor. He was a very gracious and lovely older gentleman. But we don't speak Cantonese, as you know, and he didn't speak English. And so there was another doctor translating. And it wasn't very good translation, and we were all at sea, um, and we didn't have a good meeting. And I, I just thought, I have to go. I, I, need, I need to go and get this help in Melbourne. And my nephew was there, and he could guide us and so on. So, long story short, I got the diagnosis on a Wednesday. I was on the plane to Melbourne on Thursday because we were already going on leave. You didn't need to know for a week because that was a great relief to us because we didn't know how to tell you and we needed time to absorb the news and tell our family. But we, we didn't have to tell you because you all thought we were going to a wedding for a week and we'd arranged the services. So the services were arranged. Um, the plane was arranged. Uh, we were listed on the flight on Thursday. I, I had the... Uh, the supervised rat test from the doctor, everything was in place. And guess where the best hospital in Australia for cancer was? In Melbourne, the city we were flying to. It was incredible, everything was prepared. So we got the diagnosis on. Now you know with cancer, time is of the essence. You need to, that, that, that little beggar is growing all the time. So you need to deal with it as soon as you can. So we were, we were on the flight the next day and then Friday we landed and I was giving blood. Uh, that's the hospital, by the way. It looks like something out of Star Trek. Um, it's very cool. And that, what's really cool is they have a coffee shop on every floor. That's very cool. Um, now, I had my Medicare card. This is my Aussie Medicare card. So when I got there, I just gave them the Medicare card. And they're all like, okay. And they signed me up. And we thought no more of it. Little did I know that I was unenrolled for Medicare because I'd been away 32 years. And we calculated what would be the cost if we didn't have Medicare, and if you come from overseas, the cost, we looked at all the like, costs for the chemo and the radiation, it would have been about 150,000 Australian, which is about 800,000 more. About 800,000 more. So that was the bill we would have been looking at with this guy, okay? Because this guy was unregistered, unlicensed, not valid, okay? But we didn't know. So we were there and the hospital didn't know, so we got in the door. So that was fun. Oh, by the way, that's on the bus on our way to Melbourne. We were pretty sad at that point. Um, this is a reference from the nurse in charge of head and neck cancer uh, patients. And she's writing a reference for me to give blood and to have CT and PET scan. You can see the word CT and PET. Now, ironically, this lady, after I left, herself got cancer. So the lady in charge of head and neck cancer shield. So please pray for Wendy Poon. I don't know her very well, but it's a sort of sad irony. She, she also now has cancer. Um, 
Uh, you can't read that, but that's the referral for uh, all the tests and so on. Now, on the Saturday was the wedding, so here's another providence, okay? I had to tell my family, my siblings, and I needed family support. Guess where they were? In the wedding. They were all in Melbourne. They were already there. In fact, they were in the hotel when we arrived. So when we arrived at the hotel, my, all my, my, my brother and my sister and my nephews and nieces, they're all there in the hotel. And then on, on, on Friday I was giving blood and, and meeting doctors and, and Saturday we had the wedding. So I could forget about the cancer and have a nice Saturday with my family and be in the bosom of my family. And Sunday we, had, we went to church and we had family lunch and I sat them down and I, I, I didn't tell them on Saturday because I didn't want to ruin the wedding, you know. But I sat them down on Sunday and I, I told them uh, that we told them about the cancer. And, uh, they cried and my sister cried and everybody cried. So, so this is the wedding, so we're enjoying the wedding, and the top left is my two siblings, Debbie and Mark, my brother and sister. The bottom left is the bride and groom, that's my handsome nephew Chris, he's the brother of Dr. Matt. Um, and these are the children of Dr. Matt, we spend a lot of time with them. Now I haven't seen these guys, so another blessing is, I got to spend time with my great nephews and nieces. So while I was having cancer treatment, I was hanging out with these dudes, watching their basketball games and getting abused by Ada. Ada is a dangerous person, the little one there. You can tell from the look on her face, right? It's like, don't mess with me. She's not that how old she is, four years old. When I met her at the wedding, I said, oh, I'm your great uncle Stephen. And she's like, oh, uncle Stephen. I was like, no, 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 great uncle Stephen. And then she said, um, I will call you and she picked, I forget, one of the names from Thomas the Tank Engine. <laughs> the friendly one. What's the friendly one from Thomas the Tank Engine? Huh? I can't hear. Anyway, it's the, friend, the fat friendly one from Thomas the Tank Engine. She said, I will call you this guy. And I was like, oh, okay, <laughs> you're a handful. And then I was having dinner with uh, my brother and his wife. He was a great support to me, my older brother. And so on Monday, we began the journey of testing. CT scans, PET scans, um, this is a CT scan I think. Um, these days of course it's very modern and the tubes are not so long that you go into. A CT is a, is a short tube, PET scan is a longer one, the MRI is a longer one, I, I don't know. Anyway, um, this is a room I was waiting in, in the hospital, this is Melbourne of course, and I was in this room waiting while the, they give you the, the radioactive glucose and it goes in for the PET scan. And I posted this picture. And somebody who was in the hospital saw the picture. On, it was on my Facebook, my friend. And it, it turned out that a child who I baptized 25 years ago in Hong Kong was at the hospital doing a PhD in cancer research. So that was providential, and that comes to part of the testimony I'm going to share with you later. Part of the preparation is they make this thing, which is uh, every radiation patient's nervousness. If you're into superheroes, I guess you might think it's cool. <laughs> but I didn't think it was cool. They make the radiation mask, and the radiation mask is designed, it's designed to hold you down immovable. That's its purpose. Because if you move, the radiation shots are very finely calculated. And if you move your head, you know, a centimeter, you might cook your eye instead of your cancer. Or you might cook some tissue that's very important. So they only want to cook the, the, the tissue which has cancer and that around it. So they make very, very careful calculations. Um, and um, the way the radiation works is that um, it, kills, it kills everything, basically. It kills the cancer cells and it kills the healthy cells, but the healthy cells recover. So you have radiation, break, radiation, break. During the break, the healthy cells recover, the cancer cells don't. So you keep this up for 35 days, you know, you're killing more and more and more and more cancer cells as you go. That's, that's how it works. And then the chemo flows through your whole body. The chemo like, chemical goes through your body and it kills all the little guys that the radiation misses, right? So if you have cancer cells that are like, I'm going on a journey down to the lake, you know? I'm going, oh, let's go and check out the heart and lungs, you know? The, the chemo goes after those guys. So basically your whole body gets poisoned and, and your head gets cooked. Now, on the Tuesday, after I had CT, PET scan, and, and um, something or other, a biopsy, they did a fresh biopsy, we went to a coffee shop for a, a breather. And in the coffee shop, they gave me this. Now, that's pretty neat. So all the way through, we felt that God was speaking to us. 
and encouraging us. You know, go to the coffee shop and get a Bible verse. I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord. The Lord is just reminding us in our, in our because we, we still thought it was terminal. And the Lord is just saying, I'm your helper, look to me. Um, also, another amazing thing happened. We, um, some four years ago, we purchased my mother's house in Canberra, so actually I'm the owner. And somebody, we don't know who, uh, and nobody, nobody knows it's my house, right? Except our family, nobody knows. Somebody put Bible verses in the mailbox. That means they're the, to me, because I'm the householder, right? So these are addressed to me, that's how I took it. Um, except they're anonymous. Some anonymous person put Bible verses in my letterbox. And they're not just any Bible verses. Listen to this. Now put yourself in my shoes, okay? And I, I, my, my sister was collecting the mail in Canberra. And she said, I've got these Bible verses in your post box. I said, I'll set them up. So she took pictures and she set them up. And this is what I read. Isaiah 41. I took you from the ends of the earth. From its farthest corners I called you. I said, you are my servant. I have chosen you. I have not rejected you. I was feeling really rejected. I was feeling like a failure. I was feeling, you know, I, I deserve this for my sins, you know. I, I was feeling down. And it says, I have not rejected you. I'm not finished with you. So do not fear. I am with you. Do not be dismayed. I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Now there's a lot of Bible verses you could have got in your mailbox. That one is like written for me. Do you understand? And then there was this one from Zephaniah. The Lord your God is with you. He is mighty to save. He will take great delight in you. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with great joy. Wow. What, what, you know, God is speaking. Are you listening? God is speaking. So all the circumstances, everything fell into place. The Lord is saying, lift up your eyes to the hills. From where does your help come? It comes from me. Look to me. I took you from the ends of the earth. I'm not, I'm not finished with you. Now, my wife never doubted. She, she was full of faith that I would be healed and everything would be fine. But I was full of doubts. Now, this was a problem. In Australia, you can't do anything without a local general practitioner, doctor. So I tried to find a GP. And um, it's very difficult because in Melbourne there's a big shortage of GPs. So I went to my nephew's GP, general practitioner, and um, it was really a terrible experience because there's so many, so, so few doctors that you just get 10 or 15 minutes and you have to do your business really quick and get out. And so we didn't know that. So we went in and I have, I, you have to give your medical history and I have a long list of heart and lung and prostate. You know, I'm an old guy, okay? I have a lot of medications. And my nephew had emailed my medical history to the doctor beforehand, but he hadn't read it. And he said, I want to see the boxes, the medication boxes. I'm like, I haven't brought them. And I'm like, we emailed, the doctor has emailed it to you. And um, he's like, no, I want to see the boxes. He said, okay, you tell me. So we started with the first, you know, my heart condition. And we, we hardly started. And he's like, um, okay, time's up. It's just like, literally, hello, how are you? A few minutes and then time's up. You have to go. And I'm like, what? And he's like, no, you have to go. Time's up. Like, what do we do? And he's like, you, you have to make another appointment, but this time make four appointments, so four 15 minutes, and you come back and I'll give you an hour. So I was like, oh, when can we get four, when can we get an hour? Oh, maybe a month from now, you know? So uh, that was really a total waste of time and I never went back to him. But uh, we went out to pay the bill. And when we went to his assistant to pay the bill, she took the, the Medicaid card, because you pay half it, the government pays half, and she's like, or something like that. And she's like, oh, you're not registered on Medicare. <laughs> and I was like, oh no. <laughs> you remember that debt of 800,000 mop that they're going to have to pay for the cancer treatment? Oh no, I'm not registered on Medicare. What do I have to do to register? Re register. And I, like, I've been away for 32 years. And she's like, well, check out this website. So we went home, an hour on the phone to Medicare in order to re enroll. I had to have a place of residence to prove that I was resident in Australia. That had to be ownership or a rental lease. And we had to have um, bills like electric bills, um, home insurance, water bills, things like that. And also the passport. 
From three months earlier, I didn't have a passport, but fortunately I renewed my passport. Because of COVID, you know, all this is COVID. So, guess what? I had all those things. Now, I actually brought them with me because my mother taught me always be prepared. She was like a Boy Scout. Always be prepared. So I brought bills with me and I had them on my phone. And um, it was providential because during COVID, we weren't able to rent the house or sell the house because it's full of my mother's junk. And so we couldn't go back and sort out all the stuff with my siblings. And then my sister was using it to store her stuff in and she was staying there while she was fixing her house. So I couldn't do anything with the house. That means for three years the house was unrented. That's like um, 100,000 mob a year that we were losing in rent. Um, so uh, we, we, couldn't, we couldn't rent the house. And I thought this was a, a huge disaster. And the last three years I've been grumbling like we can't rent the house, we can't sell the house, we can't do anything with the jolly house. You know, and every year you're paying money for electricity, insurance, water, all these things. And the family members are all living there and not helping, not paying rent, right? You know, so I'm grumbling and grumbling. And then we got down there. And the lady in Medicare on the phone says, well, you need to have a residence and pay electricity and water. And I'm like, I have those things. <laughs> What are the odds, you know? What are the odds? Everything was there. So I just said, oh, I got those things. So I, I emailed her the, the documents, and she said, no problem, you're in, you're in, all bang, new car. 800,000 mob saved. <laughs> so I lost, I lost 300,000 and I gained 500,000, <laughs> okay? So I, I just really feel like God prepared everything for us. Everything fell into place. Um, and everything was ready. Wednesday diagnosis, Thursday on the planet, Friday given blood, Monday biopsy, tests, everything. They did the, 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 the calculations and the mass, and in three weeks we were going in for radiation and chemotherapy. It could not possibly have been any faster, and it was paid for by the Australian government, thank God. So uh, technically I'm now resident in Australia. <laughs> <laughs> um, except, except I come back, but you're allowed to change your mind, and you can come back for five years. If I stay here longer than five years, I get the registered again. This is um, the hospital is the top right, the triangle, and the blue line shows where we stayed. So we rented a little room. It was a very nice little room, uh, and we got it because you can see how close it is. That's literally one and a half blocks. Because when you get quite sick, you have to go in as if you're an outpatient. So we needed somewhere close and comfortable. And the first place we got had no view. The window was walled up. So Crystal couldn't look out the window and she was very depressed. And so we had to move. So this is, this is one room. The bed is behind me. Everything is in one room except for the bathroom, of course. And that's the room we, we lived in for four months. So when you were sending us messages, I was sitting on the sofa there uh, or on the bed. We were on the, there. And Crystal was there for church. And there, this is where we lived for, for four months. And we would get out and... I would walk to the hospital like this for the radiation and chemo. Now having, having these treatments is a full-time job which taxes. That means it, it wears out of the 35 minutes already. I give myself 10 more minutes. I need to move quickly. Um, maybe 15 minutes. <laughs> it's a full-time job. It taxes your body, your emotions, your discipline, your faith, your family, your bank balance and your plans. Everything is challenged. It's physically demanding. It's psychologically demanding, it's depressing, it's emotionally demanding, and you have to be vigilant. You have to do a lot of stuff. Um, this was my schedule, it's two weeks, top and bottom, that's two of the seven weeks, and you can see there's lots of appointments. There's chemo, there's radiation, there's um, radiation nurse, so we met regularly each week with the radiation nurse, with uh, the doctors, um, with the uh, dietitian, and with the pharmacist. So one, of the, one of the problems with my cancer is that it, it, it affects your throat. So for some people then their throat swells up and they can't swallow. And also your throat becomes burned. So it's like having a suntan, but the suntan is not just on the outside, it's on the inside as well. So you're burned on the inside. So it becomes painful to swallow. And, um, and I have a lot of medications. I have heart medications and lung medications. So what do you do? If you can't swallow your heart medication, you're on lung medication for two months, you're in deep trouble. So they have a pharmacist to find alternatives that they can give it to you in liquid form or inject it or something like this. 
So you work with the pharmacist. But in, but in my case, this was one of the providential things. I never needed her help. Uh, always was able to swallow all the way through all those big pills, you know, those horse pills you get from the doctor. I was able to swallow all these pills the whole way through. And they, they were amazed. And so you have this daily routine, multiple hospital visits, you have to take care of oral hygiene, you have to use the mouthwash six times a day, a special mouthwash. It's just the sodium and sodium bicarbonate and stuff. But you need to use pixters, you need to avoid alcoholic drinks, caffeine, Coca Cola, sugar. Um, and you have to use a toothpaste, which is 1.1% fluoride, twice a day, and leave it in your mouth, which is pretty horrible. Um, and you have to do this for the rest of your life, by the way, um, because one of the side effects of radiation to the head is um, dental cavities. And when, when it starts, it takes off, like, it travels very fast. So once you get dental cavities after head, head and neck radiation, they say you pretty well can't stop it. So you've got to stop it before it starts. So you need this hygiene. You also have to be concerned with your physical hygiene because you can't have a proper shower because your, your, head, your neck is burned. Have you ever had a sunburn? Ever tried to have a shower when you have a sunburn? It's not easy, right? It's not pleasant. So uh, it's not easy to have a shower when your neck is burned and your head is burned from the radiation. So you have to find a way to sort of get this bit under and this bit under and you know, wash this bit and, and not, not get the hot water on you. And also you don't want soap. Because the soap dries the skin, so you can't you need to have the soap substitute, you know. So it's, it's tricky and it's exhausting. And you can't just stand in the shower and enjoy a jolly good shower. So everything is exhausting. On top of that, when, you, when your body is, you're killing the cancer cells, right? But you're also killing all the healthy cells in your head and neck. So your body goes into overdrive to heal. So it's healing the healthy cells as best it can. That means you have, need a high load of carbohydrate and protein. You need a lot of carbs and a lot of protein. Um, but at the same time, your mouth is, tastes like salt, like it's badly salted, and everything tastes like wax or cardboard. So eating food is like, you can't imagine how horrible it is. It's like trying to eat salty wax or salty cardboard. It's the most horrible experience. But you must eat, because if you don't eat, you will lose weight rapidly. Your body will not have the nutrition to heal you, you will, your, and your life expectancy will plummet. But not only that, your head will shrink, so that when you're inside that mask, you will rattle around. They don't want your head to move in the mask, because you might cook your eyeball or something, right? So you can't lose weight. So they don't want you to lose any more than 5% which for me was about 7 kilos. Now I went in there 140, 153. Now I'm 142. But I was 153. And they said, if you get to 146, we're going to put a feeding tube in through your nose into your stomach. And all you're feeding for the next few months will be by a feeding tube. And I was afraid. And I said to them, how many people have to have this feeding tube? And they lied. They said, ah, about 20%. <laughs> they lied. So, one of the things about the cancer treatment um, is that they, they're really very loving and they're very caring. And so they don't tell you what's coming. Because that if you knew what's coming, you'd probably go home. <laughs> so they release information to you as you go through. They give you the morphine, they give you the painkillers as you need them. They don't tell you two weeks in bed, oh, in two weeks you're really going to be in pain, here's the morphine. You know, they wait until you need it, and then they give it to you. So, um, yeah, so we had, also I had to exercise, because they said if you walk about 30 minutes a day, um, you'll have a better outcome. So, exercise, you know, you're dying from fatigue and from chemo, and you have to walk, it's, it's really something. So the whole thing is very challenging. However, I had support, and... One of the, the points of this message is, I have two points. One is the faithfulness of God, and the other is the importance of the church community. God is in the business of creating church. Church is God's idea. You think coming here this morning is your idea? It's not. You're just getting in line with His plan. God's purpose for you is to be part of a church, and to be a ministry, and to support it, and to build your local church. That's His plan for the world. And I, I want to illustrate this um, as we go through. This was a card from... The map from Robert and Crescenda, and they sent they sent this stuff. And I think a church council sent me like three of these boxes. Was it 
Lucy and Mandy and other people were sending us uh, these boxes. The problem was, they're all full of chocolate. <laughs> What's the one thing a cancer patient can't eat? Chocolate. You can't eat so like salty wax. So by the end of seven weeks, I had this pile of my favorite dark chocolate like this. Crystal gave it all away. <laughs> uh, I, still, I still can't enjoy chocolate. I still can't enjoy chocolate. So, um, anyway, Crystal enjoyed the goodies. Thanks very much. She, she, she enjoyed all the goodies very much, and I just looked at them long, longingly. Now, there are three tools that doctors use to fight cancer. There's cutting, cooking, and chemo. These days, they have modern therapies, DNA to diagnose, and something called gene cells inserted in, in T cells. I don't know what that means. You have to look up. Immunotherapy, new drugs, vaccines. The Gardasil vaccine is one of them. If I'd had Gardasil as a child, I wouldn't have got cancer. So make sure all your children are vaccinated with Gardasil. I'll just say that. Um, so, number one, the first C, chemotherapy. I was given something called cisplatin. You can see it says, what's the word in the top left? Cytotoxic. That means it kills everything. <laughs> That's the meaning of cytotoxic. It means it kills the cells. So it's not a lot of fun. Um, it's a lot of fun getting it put in because you're there for four hours and they, they pump sodas, they pump um, saline and, they, and then they, they pump magnesium and then they, they give you cookies and sandwiches and soup, you know, so it's like you're sitting there and the seat's really comfortable and they're pumping all this stuff into you and it's like, oh, this is okay, you know, and then, and then the next, that evening it, it hits you, you know, and, and then you get the diarrhea and the headaches and the constipation and the pain and all, all the other stuff comes along. So this is me, and one of the things that all the, the things they pump into you makes you do is it makes your kidneys wake up and so it's like you're peeing every five minutes because they want your kidneys to be um, to be working to get the, ke the, the, the chemo out. So they put the chemo in to kill the cancer, but they want the chemo to come out as soon as possible. So they basically set you up so you, you're peeing all the time. So, um, uh, keep going. So, and you can see the nurses are all wearing rubber suits. You know, they're all in hazmat suits. They're all in hazmat suits because they don't want to have even the, the whiff of the chemo. So you're here all exposed, you know, and the nurses are all rugged up, you know. So it's a lot of fun. And then you're in the snake pit with all the other people who are having cancer treatment, so you're trading jokes and, and talking with them. And this is my faithful friend who was with me through the whole thing. She never left my side the whole time. And in fact, one of the great blessings of the last seven months was we were just together all the time. And, you know, you, you sort of wonder beforehand, are we going to kill each other by the end of this? And it didn't happen. We got along and we were so happy. And now we come back. I've hardly seen her for two weeks. <laughs> She's been doing Sunday school and I've been doing church. So that was a huge blessing. We just had all that time together. And she took up knitting. And she knitted like ten blankets and all these other things. She knitted so many. You ask her about it. She knitted so much stuff. It's crazy. The house in Canberra has all these blankets that she's knitted. Um, so how do you deal with chemo? I get by with a little help from my friends. Dexamethasone is a really strong um, steroid, so you have steroids to deal with inflation, anti-nausea drugs. Uh, in my so I had diarrhea. I didn't know what to do. I thought there would be some high-powered, uh, important medication that the government, the hospital would give me to deal with the, uh, with the, uh, the diarrhea. And I'm like, well, what do I do to deal with this? And they're like, Imodium. <laughs> I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> and it, it works. <laughs> Painkillers, they gave me morphine, they gave me lidocaine. Now here's another answer to prayer or miracle was that most people, they give you the morphine at week three of seven weeks. And I didn't need it till just nearly the final week. Now that's remarkable. And um, people are taking morphine every night, self-administering, you can take as much as you like. It's like, oh yay. The problem is you can become addicted. So I didn't want to use it, so I took Panadol. So all through my chemo radiation, I survived on, on Panadol Osseo. This took one, two a day, that's all, or maybe, no, every, every eight hours I took it, so three times a day. But um, they were amazed. They, they said, no one, no one does this, you know, what's wrong with you? I said, I don't know, everyone's praying for me. So, um, so I didn't hardly need the morphine except at the end in order to sleep. Another side effect was um, some, on a couple of occasions my blood pressure crashed. So that's a very low blood pressure, 84 over 50. And then they, they didn't want to give me the chemo that day and it took them a long time to get me back up. So there were all these side effects. Oh, you can't read that. Long list of horrible side effects. One of the side effects at the bottom is cancer. 
So, <laughs> three percent of people who get this drug get cancer from it. So that's fun. I also had severe chest pains. Every Friday and Saturday, I had these rolling severe chest pain uh, for like half an hour, and I was very scary. And I think, in retrospect, it was stress. They put me in Royal Melbourne Hospital for a day, and they did all the heart attack tests, and I wasn't having a heart attack, thank God. So they said, well, we think it's just stress. I said, yeah, you think? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, oh, by the way, <coughs> by the way, that's, that's an x-ray. That's a modern x-ray machine. You just sit there and they take your x-ray. Well, it's pretty cool. Um, feet swell up, edema, that means the kidney's not coping. Um, had a lot of edema struggling with. So you have all these things. Now, that's, that's chemo done. How's the time going? Okay, I've got three minutes. <laughs> Every Monday I had to have a blood test, and um, so they do the blood test to see how the chemo is affecting your red blood cells, your white blood cells. There's a whole lot of things they check in your blood, and I don't know what they all are. But basically every day, my readings for the whole seven weeks were almost, almost always normal, or, or very slightly off, off normal. And that was remarkable, they, they were amazed. And I said, does this ever happen? They said, yeah, it does happen, but it's very rare. And um, you could see the bruise that <laughs> the lady couldn't find the vein, so she was trying to find the vein and got bruised. But um, th this, you can't see that, it's too small. But basically, almost all the readings were in normal range. And I put this down to your prayers. So you were praying for me, don't think that your prayers weren't being answered. I, 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 I was like their A student. They were all like, how come you're doing so well? I'm like, well, I don't know, are people praying for us? You know, and in, in a hospital where everything is science, it's hard to say that, you know, um, because you don't want to be two religious people dying around you of cancer, but, but um, it's like, well, there's a lot of people praying for us around the world. And they're like, well, you're doing so, so amazing, this is so good. So, and despite the great difficulty of things, I was doing very well compared to most people. And so regularly, nurses and doctors would say to us, we're, we're, they used the word gobsmacked, one nurse said, I'm gobsmacked. The dietitian said, by how well you're doing. I'm amazed at how well you're doing. The oncologist, the radiation oncologist said, your progress is extraordinary and exceptional. So it was a miserable journey. It's the hardest thing I've ever done. But I felt the power of your prayer. So, and I'm not just saying that. I, we really, we both felt it. Um, when they said extraordinary, exceptional gobsmack, they're referring to things like diet, weight retention, pain levels, Blood reading, skin condition, swallowing, mouth condition, nausea, headache, vision, etc. So I, it could have been a lot worse for me. And it is a lot worse for most people. Radiation, that's me, the fat guy. You can see 153 kilos of me there. Getting my head strapped in. I'm claustrophobic. This was my greatest fear. They give you lorazepam or Ativan to make you chill. Um, doesn't work that well, uh, to be honest, but it helps a bit. And... Um, you know, you get your head strapped in. It takes about 20 minutes to do the whole thing. So it's not too bad, unless you have, yeah. So, so uh, but it was really still, for me, quite terrifying. So sometimes I would have to say, stop, stop. And, and then I got used to it. And after about halfway, I, I was able to train myself to go through it, and I would just sing hymns in my head. So what I would do is I would, I would go here. I would come to here to be with you. I'd close my eyes. And I would take myself to this place, to another place, and I would sing through in Christ alone, I would sing through the hymns in my mind. And I'd be like, oh, this is a five hymn day today, or this is like a ten hymn day today. With the scan. Because sometimes the scan is longer, sometimes as well as the radiation, they also do a CT scan for good measure, uh, to check your progress. So some scans are longer than others. So um, the, the people were angels, so I have to say, the nurses were wonderful. They were so kind. So, you can see fat on me there. Um, and this one I've got a drip, because I'd come from chemo, and they hadn't finished the drip, so I had the drip and the radiation at the same time. That was fun. Um, so there we go. I'm, I'm going, I'm going un, under there. I don't know who took the picture. I think Crystal, you're making the V sign. <laughs> Side effects of radiation, all that stuff. Coughing, coughing, swelling, blurry vision, headache. Breathing trouble, blah, 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 blah. Change in appetite, fatigue, etc. It's not, not much fun. So you have to eat. Now here's the thing. I was losing three to four kilos a night. Just think about that for a second. Three to four kilos a night. 
So you say, how do you lose 34 kilos of mark? Well, it goes out in urine. You pee it out, basically, and you breathe it out through your uh, air. But um, it's a lot. And bear in mind, I can't lose weight. If I lose weight, I might burn the wrong thing, and they're going to stick a feeding tube in me, which I was really scared of. I'm basically a coward, okay? God is kind to cowards, I discovered. So I had to eat and eat and eat, except you don't want to eat. So part of the grace of God was that Crystal would always try and think of something new to make. You know, French toast or steak and eggs. And by the end of the seven weeks, I was still eating steak and eggs. And I went into the oncologist on the seventh week and he said, what did you have for breakfast? Because they hit you with these random questions. What did you have for breakfast? And I said, steak and eggs. He's like, what? No. I said, yeah, have steak and eggs. He said, that's very bizarre. He said, most people can't eat steak and eggs until a year after the treatment because their mouth and their throat is so damaged by the treatment that they can't chew and swallow the meat. It's too rough. Hello? I was eating steak and eggs all the way through, <laughs> thanks to you guys. <laughs> Do you understand? Your prayers carried me through. I was able to eat. And then I found out it's not 20% of people who get the feeding tube, it's 80% of people there. <laughs> they lie, you see. So they didn't want me to be scared, but I was scared. Anyway, I fought so hard to try to keep my calories up. And I was so relieved when we made it to the end and they're like, okay, you're safe. We're not going to put a feeding tube in. I'm like, oh, thank you, God. I don't have to have the feeding tube. But it was really, really a battle. It's a psychological battle. And you have to force yourself to eat. And they have these drinks, sustenance drinks. Each one is 400 calories. They're absolutely disgusting. They're super sweet. So you can use those, but you don't want to because they're so horrible. Anyway, fatigue is a symptom of radiation. So I was doing a lot of this, falling asleep. You can see the blisters beginning to happen. So it's like a burn. Uh, you get burn blisters. Um, and you can see it gets pretty, pretty chunky. It gets kind of pussy and horrible. Um, and uh, there we go. And it's all, it's all healed now. So thank God. But this is mild. This is mild. Most people have it three times worse than this. So once again, I felt that God protected me. See, my testimony today is just that God protected me. I'm not claiming that God healed me. Because I have a cancer which 80% of people survive. So I don't know what God did to the cancer. Maybe he went around and killed all the little cancer cells. I, I'm happy to believe that. Crystal believes that. Um, I don't know. But what I'm testifying to is the faithfulness of God. And that he was with me and he helped me through this whole jolly nightmare. Finally, the happy day came and we were at the end. I add this 23rd of July... Anna was here and you guys prayed for me. You remember you got in small groups and you all prayed for me? That was me on that day. When you were praying for me, I thought, I'm going to take a picture. So on the left, can you see how fat my neck is? That's edema from the lymph fluid that was stuck. Uh, it's there at the top right. That's the edema. Look at it, the bottom one on the right. That's a week later. Can you see the difference? Yeah. It's an enormous difference. Look at me now. Mm. I'm pretty much normal. That happened from the time you prayed for me. So for, um, for six, seven weeks before that, every day it was getting worse and getting worse. I was having trouble swallowing. I was getting really scared that they would have to put in a stoma for breathing because I couldn't swallow. And, and I was at that stage when Anil got you to stop and pray for me. And the following week, it just began going down, going down, going down, going down, going down. And it never went back up again. And it, it can do, you know, for patients. And, you know, maybe it will again. I don't know. But uh, I just uh, thank you for your prayers because you did that. Okay? The Lord did that. Uh, one funny thing that happened was, you can see the left, I'm quite grey. So after the radiation, I was like really grey. But it's a little bit darker now, is it? Is it a bit darker? Okay, good. <laughs> okay, let's get to the rubber hit the road. I don't know if you can see the top right, um, but can you see where the white arrow is? Yes. So, um, you can see the black is the throat channel. And everything above the white arrow at the top is a, is a f faint white line. Can you see that? Yeah. That's the tumor outline. Now look at the bottom picture at five weeks. The same area is outlined. The arrow is in the middle and there's no tumor. Can you see that? Yeah. No, can you see it? Yeah. Okay, it's gone. It's gone. So that's the chemo radiation, but I also think your prayers help. Uh, and the doctor was really happy. And then this at the end of seven weeks, now, the two pictures on the left are before. 
So you can see the bottom one is the cancer. And the top one is a little bit of cancer. They're different slices, they're different slices through the head. But you can see the right picture, the bottom, no cancer. You see that? Right picture, bottom, no cancer. No. So, thank you. Right picture, right picture. You see the cancer I showed you earlier? That's the triangle on the right. See the left? Left, no cancer. That's a, that's a sick leave letter for, for six months, sick leave. <laughs> Anybody want a copy? I'll sell it to you. A hundred more, you can make your own. I, I just want to close with all these pictures. This is the team, that's my Dr. Chris. Uh, the nurses, Matt, my family, the children, the children. My friend Morris from the church in Hong Kong is now in New Zealand, he's a periodontist, came all the way from New Zealand to see me. How about that? And he told me how to look after my gums. <laughs> look at this guy. You know this guy? Uh, he was in Melbourne for his business and he, he came to see me. Um, I have to talk to him. You know, he's a wine grower. You know, wine causes seven kinds of cancer. <laughs> we, we, we need to have words. <laughs> My dear friend Christo on the right. Christo set up our PA system, all our PA system. He purchased it, he trained us, he trained our, our PA team. Uh, the guy on the right is my old friend, came. This is the girl in the middle, and uh, Anne is doing her PhD. She's the child, I baptized her and her sister in Hong Kong like 25 years ago. And she just happened to be at the hospital doing cancer research. So all these things were like God's angels, you know. These were my best mates from high school. Can you see the top picture? Who's the handsome chap in the middle? <laughs> And here's the handsome chap in the middle of the bottom. <laughs> that's how we look after 50 years. So you see all these, that's my siblings. What I realized, this is the pastor of the church we attended at Elevation. Top right is Pastor Larry. He's the guy that was healed of cancer. Completely healed and dramatically healed. And he set up this church and his son is now pastoring it. This is my barber. This guy, his, his name is uh, Zed. Zed, he was Muslim. So we had chats about God and cut my hair, charge me a fortune. Um, <laughs> charge the Christian pastor. Corby, that's my, my brother's dog. Crystal loved Corby. We met this guy. <laughs> this is an old schoolmate who used to, used to make fun of me in school about believing in Jesus. And I met him for the first time after 40 years. And he's now leading worship in church. He's a very, very gifted musician. I, I wish we could get him here to help with our Christmas carols. He's amazing. Um, this was a friend of my dad's. We went to this church and then we just found out that this guy was there who's, who had actually been my brother's senior pastor and a colleague of my dad's. So everywhere we met, we, everywhere we went, we ran into people. Uh, and we just felt God sent all these angels. And most especially, these were our best angels. Do you re recognize these guys? Every Sunday we watched the service. Every Sunday we looked to see you waving and saying hello. Every Sunday this was our survival. Uh, it was the highlight of our week. I'm not just saying it. This was the highlight of our week to, to be with you spiritually and to see this. We just longed to spend that time. And then I got home. And there was a lovely welcome home from Grace. So what's the toughest challenge you've ever faced in your life? That's it. So my testimony today is God is faithful. Sometimes he heals people who have cancer. Sometimes he doesn't. I'm sure about that. Sometimes he says yes. Sometimes he says no. But God is faithful. And he works through the church. God's people all over the world. And we are part of a mighty family of God. And of course many of you are our angels as well. So, I hope that you're inspired. It's not a, like I had cancer and God healed me testimony, although that did happen. Um, but it's just a different kind of testimony. Okay? All right. How's the seat? Is it numb? Are you okay? Do you want to stand up and stretch? Okay. okay. Let's go. Yeah, it took me a long time to do all that album. All right. Um, I'm surprised the children are not here, because time is well up. Let's declare our faith in the words of the Creed. We say together, we believe in one God, the Father of the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth.
but already singing and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, God from God, true God from true God, the God from God from God, the one being with the Father, through Him all things are made. For us and for our salvation, He came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, He was incarnated with the Virgin Mary in the Decaying Man. For our sake, He was crucified and the Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in the corners of the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will rest on him. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Please be seated. I'm going to skip over the intercessions, Chris, so we can um, just go to the confession. I'd just like to take a moment of quiet prayer. Um, the children will probably start coming in. What I'd like to ask you to do is to just bring before the Lord, as we mentioned earlier, any situation in your life where you need the faithfulness of God, where you need your confidence in God's faithfulness to be strengthened, where you need to know God's provision, His guidance, His financial provision or His healing, just bring before the Lord now, maybe you can open your hands out to God now and, and just in your mind hold that situation, that person or that thing in your hands and just bring it before God. And Lord, we ask that you would be faithful to every person here today, even as you were faithful to me and Crystal. We ask, Lord, that you would show yourself mighty to save, that you would be in every person's individual circumstance, with every person's family members, and be with them in their heart and mind. We just have a, a, a minute of silent prayer as we bring our needs uh, before the Lord. John, if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just, and you will forgive our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us confess our sin against God and our neighbor as we pray together, most merciful God. We confess that we have sinned against you, Lord, word and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive what we have been, amend what we are, and direct what we shall be, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your hands. Hear these words of absolution and forgiveness. May Almighty God have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Would you please stand for the greeting of peace? We are the body of Christ. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Let us greet one another with the peace, shalom, the blessing of Christ. Your shirt says, say peace. Peace be with you. Peace be with you. Peace be with you, Father. Bless you.
different churches while we're away, um, and most of them don't have offerings anymore in Australia because people do it online. Um, but I thought it was a great loss because every Sunday I'd go with my cash ready to give the offering, and then there'd be no offering. Um, <laughs> so there's probably a lot of people like that. So actually, I think we need both. We need the online and also the... Yeah. But also, this is symbolic. It's, um, the, the money that we give is symbolic of our life and our blood, sweat, and tears. So even if we have online offering, we still need to do this, I think. And also, we're bringing up the bread and the wine, and we're bringing our lives to God. So let us pray. Blessed be God forever. Yes. Yours, Lord, is the greatness, the power, the glory, the splendor, the majesty. For everything in heaven and on earth is yours. All things come from you, and of your own do we give you. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. All glory and honor, thanks and praise are yours, now and always, Lord, Holy Father, mighty Creator, ever-living God. We give thanks and praise for your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, who by his death on the cross on Good Friday and rising to new life on Sunday, has offered the one true sacrifice for sin and obtained an eternal deliverance for his people. Therefore, with the whole company of heaven, the saints, and those who have gone before us, we proclaim your great and glorious name, forever praising you and saying, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory, Hosanna in the highest. And now, Father, we pray that we who receive these your gifts of bread and wine, according to our Saviour's word, may be partakers of his body and his blood. For on the night he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, his almighty Father, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. He's escaping. <laughs> After supper, he gave the cup, and again giving you thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the remission of sins. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. We declare together, Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again. We pray together, sanctify these gifts by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son. We offer our prayer and praise, Father, Holy Spirit, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Blessing and honor and glory and power are yours forever and ever. Amen. So Saviour Christ taught his disciples, if you're with your mum and dad and you're comfortable, you can hold hands with them. You don't have to hold hands with strangers if you don't want to. But you're welcome to join hands with your family as we pray together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Give us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. We do not presume to come to this your table, blessed the Lord, trusting in your own righteousness, but in your manifold great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the promise of your table, but you are the same Lord, whose nature is always to have mercy. Grant us therefore, gracious Lord, so to be the flesh of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that we may have a more welcome him than he has. The gifts of God for the people of God, his body broken and his blood shed. Let us take them in remembrance that Christ died for you, and let us feed on him in our hearts by faith with thanksgiving. As always, we invite you, if you are baptized and believe in Christ, to join with us in communion. You can hold out your hands, teach your children to do this. Um, we don't take, we receive in our tradition. If you're not baptized, please cross your hands on your chest and you can receive in that way. I also will let you know that some of the bread that I have is a whole, whole wheat. So it looks different, but it's, it's okay. Thank you.
of my radiation pops when I was in the radiation chamber. That's the one I sang more than anything in Christ alone, my hope is found in my name. All right, next slide. Let us pray together as we remember the words of St. Paul, whether I, we live or die. If we live, we live for the Lord. If we die, we belong to the Lord. Let us pray together. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart through Christ our Lord. Amen. The blessing unto God's gracious mercy and protection I commit you. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance on you and give you peace. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and those of you love now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Let's close as we sing, come, all you weary. Actually, we should sing, go, all you weary. Anyway, we're going to have more to say before we get up.
peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's stand for morning, please. Bless you. Thank you for coming today. Hello Stephen in Melbourne. <laughs> How are you? <laughs> it's heavy and <impressive. laughs>